You are called now to live out of this position and to become in your practice what you are in your position. And you are in your position dead to sin. And now the Bible calls you to put death into practice. And it does that by saying some paradoxical things about you. Namely, die. And you should not come back to the Bible when it says die and say, I am dead. You should come and say, because I am dead, therefore I most certainly will die. How does our position in Christ relate to our daily practice as Christians? In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper turns to John 12, 20 to 26 to show how our death to sin when we first believed becomes our reason to live and love today. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on June 18th, 1995. We'll read verses 20 through 26 of John chapter 12. Now there were certain Greeks, which is an odd thing, by the way, that Greeks would be here in Palestine wanting to see Jesus. Just keep that in mind. They are foreigners. They're like away from home. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These, therefore, came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, saying, not the kind of answer you might expect, but here's what he said. Verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now here you have these Greeks. They say, verse 23, we want to see Jesus. We want to see him. Now the question is, did they get to see him? What happened here? We want to see Jesus, it says in verse 21. Not 23, 21. We would see Jesus. Did they see him? What do you think? Nothing was said about them in the rest of the gospel. They're, that's it. That's all we hear about them. And Jesus gives this word of response. Did they see him or didn't they see him? And probably the answer is they did see him, but not the way they thought they would see him. They saw him in word And a word that as Jesus spoke it through Andrew and Philip was probably brought to bear on those Greeks in a way that the truth that was first spoken about Jesus became a truth for them. My deep conviction is that all self-revelation from Christ is confrontation to people. And until the self-revelation becomes a confrontation, it isn't a revelation. Until the truth that Jesus has to say about himself so that we can see him becomes truth for us and in us, we don't see it and we don't hear it. Until self-revelation becomes confrontation and lives within us, the dynamic interchange of what I mean by seeing and showing Christ doesn't happen. So here's what happens. Let's just walk through the process and try to figure out what is Jesus doing here For these Greeks and for us today. Why does he talk this way? Why didn't he just go with them? What is going on here? Verse 23. Jesus responds. So there are are Greeks who want to see me. They want to uh, behold me. Here is a truth. Here's a truth for these Greeks. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Tell them that. In other words, 
I really am somebody to see. I am about to enter onto a phase of existence through my humanity into glory with my Father that if they knew what they were asking, they would really mean it. I am glorious. I am worthy to behold. I am about to be glorified. But not in the way that you, my disciples, or they expect. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It is time for me to be glorified. The pathway to my glory is death like a seed. You tell the Greeks that I have a hard work to do that I might bear fruit in their lives, that they might see me, because if I leave the path that I'm on towards death and glory, they will never see what they want to see. And I will never bear any fruit in this world if I am to accomplish what they want me to accomplish, namely to see something great, to see something saving, to see something hopeful, to see something transforming in the world, I cannot come to them. I am on the brink of Gethsemane. I'm on the brink of Calvary. I'm on the brink of the cross. And if I don't die, this little seed called Jesus of Nazareth will be a total failure. And nobody will want to see me ever again. I will be buried. I will come to naught someday. And I will be forgotten like millions of human beings. If I am to bear fruit in those Greeks and every other nation and in my disciples, I have to go the way of dying. Now that's the truth he wanted to communicate to them, I believe. That's the self-revelation. I am glorious. And I'm destined to be glorified, but I have to die if I am to accomplish my saving, fruit-bearing purposes in the world. Now, the question becomes, what about you? What about those Greeks? Is it all me? Do I just do my thing? Do I just die, rise, get glorified, and they see it, and that's it? Or does something have to happen in those Greeks and in us today who also hear this truth that Jesus is a dying Christ and a rising Christ and a glorified Christ? How does it get brought to bear upon us this morning and upon these Greeks? Let's read verses 25 and 26. Without any break in his conversation, he's still responding to Andrew and Philip's word about the Greeks. First, he says, I want to be glorified. I'm going to be glorified. Then he says, I'm going to have to. To die, and then it just flows right into what must be true of them too. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Now, you've got to realize where he is and where he's going. This is not some comfortable little jaunt through the countryside of Galilee. He is on his way at this juncture in John's Gospel. To Calvary. He's on his way to the Last Supper, chapter 13, into Gethsemane, 14, 15, 16, 17, into Caiaphas and Anna's house, and to the thorns, and to the striking, and to the sword and the nails. That's what he means when he says, If anyone serves me, he must follow me to Calvary, to Gethsemane, to the grave, and where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. That's the truth about me. And that's the truth about you. And so he's communicating to those Greeks and to us this morning. Do you really want to see me? Are you prepared to go with me? Are you prepared to be like me? I really want to show Jesus this summer. 
I want my life to count so that people look at me, they see the way I am, they see me at home, they see me on the street. I was walking over here this morning. This is so good. This... And these two guys, both of them had alcohol in their breath. They're talking to each other, not quite all together there. And I greet them and think I'm going to walk by and and they stopped me. And uh, I don't know how they do this, but one said, are you a God loving man? They know me. They know me. I walked that thing a thousand times. Are you a God loving man? I said, I try to be. And he said, well, can you help me out? And, and uh, he wanted money. And I said, look, I don't carry money, which I don't. I don't have a dime on me right now. I said, I don't have any money. But I'll give you what I've got. Sound familiar? <laughs> I said, I, and I thought, I thought I was going to get busted, you know? I mean, blah, blah, blah. And he said, what's that? I said, prayer. He said, okay. Okay. I said, so what do you want? And he gave me a couple of things. So right there, his buddy's kind of 20 yards away by this time, kind of looking at this thing. And I just put my hand on his shoulders, all that alcohol coming in my face, and prayed for him. I want to show Jesus this time. Now let me show you why this is glorious here. Glory number one, verse 24. Yes, we must die, but if we die, we will bear much fruit. And that's what you want in your life. The fruit of love and the fruit of joy and the fruit of peace and righteousness and the fruit of converts. People who've been changed by your life who when you die, they'll come to your funeral and say, because that person was alive, I'm different. You want that. And it'll happen if you die. That's why this text kicked me Saturday a week ago. Because I want to count for people. I don't want to just do sermons or do church. I want people to be changed, saved, rescued, transformed, reconciled, healed. Glory number two, verse 25. Yes, we must hate our lives in this world. Why? So that we might keep it for eternity. This is not a dead end street here. This is not bad news. Hard news, not bad news. Can you make that distinction? Hard news, not bad news. Because the good news is, if you will hate your life in this world, which is what Jesus was doing, Jesus could have said, I'm going back to Galilee and fish for the next 40 years. That would have been loving his life in this world. Then he turned and looked at Jerusalem Filled with people who were about to shout him down, crucify him, crucify him. And he cried tears of love for those people and died for them. That's hating your life in this world. But he knew there was glory for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame. Glory number three, verse 26. Yes, we must follow him on the Calvary road and look at the promise we get if we do. Where I am, there shall my servant be. He said those words, those exact words, one other time. You remember where? Many of you remember where. John 14, verse 3. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come, that where I am, there you may be also. He's talking about heaven, I believe, in these verses. If you will follow me on the Calvary road, you will go to heaven. And that's where I'll be and we'll be together forever and ever. No matter what you've lost in this world, you will not lose me ever, 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 ever again. And glory number four is at the end of that verse 26. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Can you fathom that promise? What would it be like to be honored by God, the maker of the universe, for God to be strolling about in heaven saying, how can I honor John? How can I honor Tim? How can I honor Mary? How can I honor Dale? How can I honor Eric? How can I honor them? 
Oh, I want to honor them. I love to honor people who serve my son. You talk about significance, whether you're 50 or any other age. These four things are it. We die. We hate our lives. We follow Jesus on the Calvary Road. We become servants and we bear fruit, much fruit. We keep our lives for eternity. We join Jesus where he is in glory and the Father honors us. Now, let me take one more little turn before we're done here. We're praying for revival. I hope you're praying for revival. I hope you're praying that we would see and show Christ so authentically, so powerfully, so forcefully, so uh, real that the world would see. To do that, we have to become like Him. To become like Him, we have to die with Him. I hope you're praying that. And I invite you to be that kind of person and to come with Jesus into the Calvary Road. And so I've been asking myself, I did this last Sunday night, and I'm doing it with you now, and I'm going to invite you at the end of the service in a moment to do it with me. What in me must die for me to bear fruit? More fruit. What in this church must die for us to bear more fruit? It's a scary question. My plan was going to be to show you the relationship between dying and love and the things that stand in the way of love in me and in this church. That's next Sunday now. Because what I saw at this point in the message as I draw to a close is this. I, I really need at this point in the message to connect what I've said about dying, hating our lives in this world, serving Jesus and following him. I need to connect those four things with the big picture of what it is to be a Christian. Because I have said to you, and I mean it, this is not peripheral, marginal Christianity. This is not for hundreds and thousands of ordinary Christians in the middle to look out to the fringes where the radicals do their missionary work and say, that's what this text is about. This text is about becoming a Christian and being a Christian. Now, I need to show you that. So let me make two simple observations as we close and point you to where I get them. Simple, straightforward observation number one. If you are a Christian this morning, if you're a Christian this morning, you have died. Not must die merely, but have died decisively. Galatians 5.24 Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Notice the tense. Have done it. If you're a Christian this morning, that's what's happened to you. That rebellious, unbelieving and self-centered self, die. You put your faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit united you to Christ. It says in Romans 6, 5 that you were united in a death like His so that what He died, you died, and His life becomes your life. That is a decisive, once for all, finished work that God performed in your life. You are dead. That's what it means to be a Christian. Or, see it again, Colossians 3. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have died. Christian, you're dead. You're dead. You have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. Don't panic because if you say, oh, wait a minute, rebellion, unbelief, self-centered, I still got a lot of those impulses in me. Me too. Me too. But watch out. Don't let your experience Interpret Scripture. Scripture says you are dead. You have crucified the flesh. That's a truth. We need to believe it and live by it. So hang on for a minute. Do not cancel that truth out of the Bible just because you can point to self-centered experiences in your life as a believer. So can I and everybody in this room if they're honest. One other text it's the meaning of your baptism. Romans 6, 4. 
we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I conclude, first observation, I'm dead. You're dead if you're a Christian. You have died. And so, what do I mean then when I ask myself last Sunday night, and I've been asking myself yesterday and this morning, what must I die to in order to bear fruit? What must we as a church die to? How shall we then die? Why do I ask the question like that when the Bible so resoundingly says, John, you're dead. Bethlehem is dead. That leads to the final and second simple, straightforward observation. The Bible says, if you are a Christian, God calls you to die daily. You're dead. And the Bible calls you to die. Now, some people can handle paradoxes and some people can. And so the Bible sometimes talks in paradoxes and sometimes it talks in non-paradoxes for all kinds of people. The Jesus type and the John the Baptist type. We sometimes play a flute and a dirge and sometimes we dance so that everyone will give an account to God that they had a testimony in their own language. So if you can't handle paradoxes, let me try to say it another way. What this means is that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, you were united spiritually. Sometimes the word mystically is used. You were united to Jesus Christ. So that what he experienced has been applied and made yours positionally. You are in Christ and he died and therefore you died and you are dead because you are positionally in him. However, there's another word you could use besides the word positionally for describing the Christian life and that is practically. You are called now to live out of this position and to become in your practice what you are in your position. And you are in your position dead to sin. And now the Bible calls you to put death into practice. And it does that by saying some paradoxical things about you. Namely, die. And you should not come back to the Bible when it says die and say, I am dead. You should come and say, because I am dead, therefore I most certainly will die. And the dying today. Suppose, Dad, it didn't go the way you wanted it to this morning. Suppose no phone call ever comes today. You can die to anger. You can. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can die to resentment and you can overflow in love to children who forget you. You can do that. And when that death happens in you, the death to the hope that they would call, when that death happens in you, you bear witness to the fact that you died. Years ago you died. You are dead in Jesus Christ. And the power to die today to that particular challenge to your death, the evidence of that real death in Jesus is whether today you put to death revenge. The real death, the finished once for all death that will not be called into question if it's real will be applied by a daily dying to sin and temptation. Now here's a text from which I get that. Romans 6, after verse 5, he says you are united with Christ in a likeness like his death. After verse 6 where he says my old self was crucified with him. Then verse 11 says Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. Do you feel the tension? You are dead. Now, reckon yourselves dead. You are positionally in Christ. And what happened to him happened to you. You have been judged in Christ. You have been executed in Christ. It is finished in Christ. You are destined for glory in Christ. Now, reckon it to be true, Christian. Believe it. Live in it. Apply it. Make it come out in your behavior. 
by the power of the Spirit, which is what it says in Romans 8, 13, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Not in your own strength. It's the Spirit dwelling in you that puts to death the deeds of the body. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper concludes our 11-part series, Loving Like God Loves, with a sermon titled, Hating Our Lives, Loving Each Other. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.